I, I don't know that, that, that I could respond to that question given the institutions that have been lobbed together. Mm -hmm. um, I think that there's considerable difference about uh, when we speak about the International Monetary Fund or the World Bank and their role and function and how they they actually operate in the world today and the United Nations, for example, which, which, uh, in my opinion, is is um, has a very different uh, role and also membership participation is very different. The IMF is much more um, exclusive and it's, it's decision making. Role. As far as how they're going to be judged, um, I think that that we're already seeing pressure to change organizations like the IMF because they are not sufficiently broad as the economies of the world evolve. Emerging countries take a much more um, credible role in world economics. Um, the pressure to let them be full partners in the economic dialogues. Um, and so I think that, that the world is going to, history is going to judge them in, inadequately if they do not rise to the challenge of uh, expanding and finding a way for uh, ever increasing number of countries to be um, fuller participants in the decision making process that is involved in, in the economic order. I think that we're, we're seeing that also with the United Nations and you know the, the, the fact that only five nations presently hold the ultimate veto power and the desire to expand um, that membership to more countries. And there, there's an openness to that. Um, so I think that, that history is going to judge these institutions by their ability to evolve and change to make themselves more inclusive. If they are able to do that, if they are able to continually renew themselves by broadening so that other nations can be participants, then I think history um, will be generous and, and positive in how it views their role. To the extent that they're not able to do that, I think that eventually history will see them as stumbling blocks in the world economic, social, uh, international um, spheres. Um, when you include NAFTA in that question, um, part of what, what comes to mind is that, um, and, and we already see some of that, in that we are realizing that, that these international agreements are oftentimes agreements that have been written and designed with various interest groups in mind, that they have not fulfilled um, promises that were made and given to constituencies that in many ways were, were uh, lacked the political clout to be sufficiently um, uh, included in the decision-making process. So um, Mexico has been severely affected by NAFTA and some sectors within the economy in Mexico um, have seen no benefit from NAFTA. Um, I think that Mexico has suffered much more so than, than the U.S., um, even though in the U.S. you, you have seen um, 
considerable loss of jobs um, in, in numerous industries. And, and the people who lost these jobs were promised that they would be retrained, that they would be given um, new skills to find uh, replacement jobs. And part of what we come to, to understand is that um, those training programs um, have been woefully inadequate. Many, many people who lost their jobs in, in assembly factories in the, U, the U.S. to this day, um, 17 years after the, the began, you know, the implementation of NAFTA, have never really fully recovered from the loss of, of their jobs.